welcome to this, the kind of fourth Coburn Conversations that kind of forms part of this year's annual uh, Edinburgh Doors Open Days, um, which is, of course, the Coburn Association's 30th year uh, in organising the event and kind of, a, and, and the global pandemic has kind of forced us to obviously change how we're managing it. So virtually everything is, co everything is coming out you kind of virtually. Um, at the very heart of the Doors Open Days experience is about getting um, into kind of buildings or places that you don't usually have a chance to or of getting in behind the facade to find out about stories that you weren't even aware of. Um, and it's in this spirit that our Coburn Con Conversations uh, is all about. It's about exploring those kind of hidden or contested or forgotten histories of, of, of the city. Um, and of course, we're delighted um, to have launched our new Doors Open Day website, um, which contains all the information you need to have have a great kind of event over this weekend. Um, just go to coburnassociation.org.uk backslash Doors Open Days for everything you'll need. Uh, and of course, we're using Zoom as our digital platform with a few different um, bits of functionalities. Uh, it is a webinar, so you, the attendees will note that your kind of video and microphone um, functions have been disabled for the duration. But if you want to uh, put a question to, to either Andrew or, or Professor Haig, then use the Q&A kind of function because we'll be monitoring that going, going through the entire evening. And of course, we are broadcasting this live on Facebook and are recording it so that we can actually uh, keep it in the can for future posterity um, for no other reason. Um, and if you're kind of enjoying, and if you've been with us for the past uh, few nights, for our Coburn con conversations, um, or are really looking forward to doors open days, um, I would commend you to look at the site and consider becoming a member of the Coburn, or making a small donation. Uh, every penny you contribute helps deliver these kind of events and helps us in protecting the amenity of this fabulous city of ours. So, with that kind of bit of advert out of the way, um, and it's without further ado, let me kind of introduce you to our two conversationalists of this kind of evening. Um, the Coburn Chairman, Professor Cliff Haig, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, um, but our guest, Andrew Crummy, uh, on the subject of how we help the people sing the story of the Craig Miller Festival Society. Professor Haig, over to you. Uh, thank you, Terry, and uh, thanks everybody for tuning in to th this conversation tonight. Uh, with the celebrated artist Andrew Crummy, who many of you will have seen the Tapestry of Scotland, that he was the uh, the creator of, basically, the, the inspiration for it. And uh, we're going to be talking a bit about his own work later on, but we're mainly starting off with one of the hidden histories of Edinburgh, which is the pioneering work done by the Craig Miller Festival Society uh, back in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. And Helen's, uh, uh, Andrew's connection with that, of course, is that his mother, Helen, Helen Crummy, was the inspiration behind that remarkable boom of community um, activity and, and arts-led regeneration. I also have to put down a sort of personal um, uh, health warning on this in that I was myself involved in a very minor way over a period of about 10 or more years uh, on the planning and housing side rather than on the, the art side, but some of the story I'm, I'm familiar with also from first hand. So, um, Andrew, your, your, your mum's famous book, um, Let the People Sing, and in this, of course, it quotes the, 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 the trigger for the Festival Society, the Peppermill Primary School, saying to your mother when she asked, could her child get violin lessons? that um, basically we have enough trouble teaching these kids the three R's, let alone teach them any music. So how did that kick things off? Well, as you say, the, the, uh, my mother <clears throat> in about 19, uh, I, I had just been born and um, I was the, the youngest of uh, three sons uh, and oldest, my oldest brother is Philip and uh, my mother went to Mr. Lyle, the head, headmaster at Peffermill Primary School, and said, uh, could my eldest son learn to play the violin? To which he replied, uh, it takes us all the time to teach these kids the three R's. And my mother had just joined the mother's group and um, she went back to the mother's group and um, 
the, instead of getting angry, over a period of time, they eventually came back to Mr. Lyle and said, we shall put on a festival and we will show you how talented our kids are. Because uh, they were angry that the, the idea that these kids weren't creative was a bit of an insult. But Mr. Lyle became a bit of a hero because he said, okay, I will, I will, um, I will help, I, I won't do it for you, but I, I will give you, I will support you. So he, he actually was a great guy in the end. So the, the, the my mother, they, sat off, they started off this festival society and it grew and grew and grew. So if we go to the next, I uh, know, so if I just, uh, if we might go back to this again, so um, it grew and grew very, very quickly, and um, <clears throat> the, the the festival just sort of opened this floodgate of creativity of all these people came forward. So it wasn't just, and within a couple of years, it wasn't just the kids they were talking about; it was the adults. And this, I'll, I'll go into that in a minute. But if you go to Craig Mullen now, there is a statue to my mother telling that story of the story of the violin, which really is the beginning of the story of the festival society. And it has become sort of a mythical story in many ways, a, a legend. Um, so if we go to the next one, uh, so in the 60s, then you see it started to grow and it grew and grew and grew. So right in, in the top left-hand uh, uh, picture, you've got the, the, the original mother's group uh, photographed in the 80s that they have been termed now dangerous women because it was these women that wanted to do the festival society it wasn't a mother it was all about lots of other people and um but particularly these mothers it really was the the mothers of Craig mother looking after their bairns but it, it became a much bigger thing so if you go to the next photograph which is just there of the of the uh, um you see the pictures of uh, the suffragette movement, which is a drama play in ni about 1966-67. But then they began to use the 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 uh, Craigmore Castle, and these are four photographs over a period of time, and they took over the the the, the, the castle, and he started to get these really huge festivals where all sorts of people were getting involved from near and far. Uh, the BBC started to come, the, the, the press began to come, and it was all about this festival week where everybody, the assumption was that everybody is creative, everybody has a part to play in society, everybody has a role to play, uh, and if you come along, you will always get, be part of it. So you end up with these sort of big events where there's just this masses of crowd, and um, and the, the, heat, the the key to it was the like the open doors was getting access to things like Craig Mother Castle and other key buildings within the area. So if we go to the next one, so this brings in begins to bring in a uh, cliff here. Um, what you've got up here is the the gentle giant, a giant sculpture they made in the like, 1976, but it was contested. It was. It was controversial because Jimmy Boyle had designed it, but actually it became the symbol of the Festival Society because it was the gentle giant lying down, uh, uh, the gentle giant that cares and shares, and that was the, the theme of this giant sculpture. And you could actually see it from, and years later, you, Google actually had a photograph of it, so you could actually see it from a satellite. It was so huge. but. It became part of 1976, it became part of this, um, what you call the CPA, which was this planning document, which was a pioneering document where the people of Craig Miller said, this is what we want. This is how we want to live. This is the sort of thing we want. So there's a whole sense of um, democracy in this. It was about involving as many people as possible. And Cliff, what do you remember of this? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, just pick up a couple of things from what you've been saying. I, th I think uh, the the photograph with the mothers was 1986, if I'm right. So it was 25 yeah. years after they they started, and uh, just so that people know Jimmy Boyle, because um, younger generation may not know the name, but uh, he'd been 
a fairly infamous, uh, it was involved in a fairly infamous Glasgow killing and uh, spent time in Berlin and uh, there got involved in, in artwork. So as, um, as Andrew said, it was, uh, it was a controversial uh, choice, but also a very important one, both for him and for Craig Miller. So yeah, the, the, the projects, um, the, 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 the festival started in the 60s, but out of that, I think there was a network, wasn't there, of, of mainly women that, uh, that Helen um, was in touch with. And they were the kind of people who um, would always sort of look out for a neighbor. And what happened was they became what we call neighborhood workers, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. And they got some funding out of a government scheme in those days, the UK government scheme in those days called Urban Aid. And yeah. there, was, there was another project that came from Jack Kane, who was the first ever Labour Lord Provost of Edinburgh. And he, uh, again, had very strong Craig Miller connections. I think might even have been related to your mother. Is that right? No, he lived uh, in the same stair. Uh, where she was very, very, close, very close. And yeah. so there was a pilot project which gave a little bit of money, building on the the urban aid money, and that was roughly about seventy two to seventy four, from what I can remember. And then there was the the, the big event, in a sense, where we put in an application to what was in those days called the common market for a project that would uh, be the people of this peripheral housing scheme, basically defining their priorities for the future. And the, the model that uh, Craigmill Festival Society had behind that in terms of its relationship with the local authority, who was of course the major uh, landlord in the area, most of the houses there were, were council houses. Um, the relationship was to be one of liaison government. And out of that, for a couple of years, this uh, team put together a, a comprehensive plan for action, as it was called, uh, which um, Andrew's shown the image of here. And uh, then sadly, of course, the EU money ran out and that coincided with a period of uh, financial cuts that were being introduced in the late 1970s and created quite a few difficulties actually for the festival society having to, to, to lay off people, but also trying to, to sustain the, the funding that they'd had. It's one of the, one of the traps of a, a project funding that is good while the project funding's there, but when the project ends, uh, it can be a steep, cliff face that you fall off. So yeah, so what's, I mean, you were actually there. I, I wasn't actually there. I was, a, I was a teenager. So I mean, this isn't my generation. So, you know, and hopefully there's people watching who were part of that. And um, so it is their story. It's not necessarily my story. But what's so interesting, because I'm a professional artist, is how out of an art project, it, it began to deal with issues like housing, social work, education, environment, and actually you see at the bottom left-hand uh, corner, the, 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 the title of the pilot projects, but this was an art, essentially it was an arts project, but it, it, it grew these other um, uh, aspects to it. So it became much more about campaigning to improve the, the well-being of the people in Craig Miller. And it also attracted uh, people from all over the world. And, and a lot of my memories are, are my mother um, talking to people like the Notting Hill Carnival. They came to see how it was done. Um, you got um, professors coming from all over the world. You got, you got a countless array of people. And actually the story isn't just one story of one woman or even the women of Craig Miller and the men of Craig Miller, but also it, it goes way, way, way beyond that. And it was a huge, huge thing. And I think the other part of it is it was related to, it was an international uh, uh, project in many ways because you had Steve Burgess, who was the academic. He had seen a similar thing in Harlem just before, just after the war, when he went to, to, when he was a student there in the early 50s. And, and he, so when he got involved with the festival, he had already seen 
aspects of this type of way, what you term now as community arts, in New York and the poorer parts of New York, New York. So it, it, it's got a huge, there's a, it's a really complicated story to tell within about 40 minutes, um, but it's a really, the, the dynamism of what the festival did uh, goes way beyond one individual or a group of people or whatever, and it's had an impact. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. So if you go into the next one, you know, Patrice Gulliver, which is now sadly gone, which is like a major artwork, really, uh, in its time. Uh, and they produced another uh, artwork, which was called The Mermaid. Now, <clears throat> this really is good to show how they used art in a positive way. It, they weren't just building a, a, a mermaid. Uh, what they got was a, 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 a sculptor from New York, Pat, Pedro de Silva, to come across and help design and build this giant mermaid, which was a fantastic object in itself. But also the reason why they did it was because at that point they were plant the city council were planning to put a motorway right through Craig Miller. And it would really have devastated the identity of Craig Miller. So instead of um, just protesting and going uptown and shouting at the at the, the city officials, they, they decided to do a sculpture. And that's why it was there. It was there as a form of protest. But also they then decided they did a community musical. So they would sing about the, the issues that they were dealing with. So it, it was using art in a positive way to encourage um, people who wouldn't really understand what Craig Miller was about. and try for them to try for them to come to Craig Miller and so they could educate them on how talented and how rich and what a strong identity Craig Miller had. So um, I don't know if you were involved with this at all Cliff but it was... Um, I, I wasn't involved again in the in the art side of the project I was involved yeah. in some of the kind of analysis about the the road and yeah. how, building the case against building the road. I think the road was called the Eastern Approach Road. And it was indeed, I think, to be a sort of um, major highway cutting that would, as, as Andrew said, have cut, uh, have cut uh, the, uh, the community in half. And uh, may, maybe just say, Andrew, whereabouts it is in case people know Craig Miller area? Well, sadly, it's no, sadly again, it's, uh, Sadly, it's no longer there, but it used to be just beside the tunnel, which is between um, Nitri and, and Bingham. So, but again, it, it, it was pulled down, um, which, which is, uh, which is uh, which, uh, there's a whole story connected to this, uh, as there is to a lot of these stories. But it was really very pioneering in its time, because it was using arts in a new way, in the sort of community arts way, where you were also, it was about involving people who had issues and helping people as much as possible. It, it was the, the gentle giant that cares and shares. That was the sort of slogan. The other thing about Craig Miller Festival Society, which is what has, has given it this enduring legacy, is that a lot of it was documented and it was put into reports and these photographs and things. Although there hasn't been a lot of academic work about uh, the Creek Mud Festival Society, and it is really still unwritten. It, a lot of people don't know about it. It, it was, um, it, it, by documenting it, 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 it conceptualised, it tried to conceptualise what it was about. So you get all these phrases like arts the catalyst, um, education the tool, community university, um, uh, lots of different phrases and, and ways of trying to work out what they were actually trying to do by using art in a social context and you know it has a power I mean if you can get a lot of people working on a project like they pioneered in Craig Miller you can you can move things forward but you have to do it a certain way and it is a way of working which really makes it what well, probably got me interested in it later on in my life because when I was still, I was at art college at the time this was getting produced, but I still wasn't really that interested. It was only later on that I really began to understand 
what uh, what my mother and all these women and men had produced. I mean, even the neighbourhood worker scheme that you talk about, I mean, that was a very interesting way of using using uh, how to deal with social work. So there was, the idea was there was always, instead of going to the social work department, you'd have a, a person and you'd have a neighbour who would, you could go to to get help. They would help you with your problems with housing or paying your rent or whatever. And um, it was just a localised way of trying to deal with the, the, the huge amount of problems that, that were in Craig Miller. Yeah, so I, think, uh, I think the neighbourhood workers, if I remember rightly, were paid the princely sum of five pounds a week for yeah. their um, contributions. And OK, five pounds bought you more in 1971 than it did now, but uh, it still was pretty tokenistic. But uh, it was uh, it created people who actually knew the people they were dealing with um, right. and uh, it was a very innovative scheme and I think just picking up on, on what you said there Andrew I mean the, the gentle giant that shares and cares is it expresses the the kind of underlying philosophy in a sense that uh, it, it also links uh, I'm just looking over the the words of one of the Craig Miller musicals the powerful in the land can't bring a change of heart but history will be made when people play their part. So it was very much this thing that uh, of, of, of mass involvement, mass inclusion, but uh, for a change. And these things went together. And when you said there were so many aspects going on, you know, uh, transport, housing, planning, environment, art, whatever. I think part of the genius of um, the people, particularly Helen, but the others who were involved in, in the project at that time was that they saw the connectivity between these things in the way that bureau bureaucracies tend to separate them out and this is still true despite it you know the years of community planning and so on but what was grasped there in Craig Miller in the 1960s and 70s was that these weren't separate that to improve people's lives and well-being you actually have to tick all these boxes, not just keep them separate. And the the whole ethos was that the the involvement in the arts activities both released and celebrated the creativity of local people who let's let's be honest, was it was quite a stigmatized community within the city. And so it was negating that, it was claiming the festival title for ordinary people at a time when the festival was seen as quite an elitist event, separate from the neighbourhoods like Craig Miller. And it was expressing that creativity through mass involvement, whether you, you were just, whether you were performing or making a costume for your kid or just going along to support the, the event or taking part in any of the other things, there was, there was dance clubs, there were so many activities going on. It was extremely creative and of course everything fed off everything else. Uh, and, the one time, uh, but the one time when they all came together was for the festival. Exactly. So, ev so everybody was part of the festival and all the neighbourhood workers were part of the were part of the, the festival. You know there was I, I think it was five women and one man, it was Paul Nolan who was the other neighbourhood worker but the, the, all these people, to me, are sort of pioneers and they should be celebrated because they actually achieved something quite remarkable that has had a, a, le a legacy. So if we go into the next one. So the, the, a key part of it was the community musicals, which ran for 30 years, as you can see in the bottom. But they often did a lot of... Um, street theatre and things and there you see Billy McCurdy as a young man um, in front of another hidden gem in Craig Miller. There's lots of hidden artworks and buildings in Craig Miller, not many people know about it. And there's the, the walk-up mausoleum which uh, Billy's uh, uh, fighting someday with um, and that's a real gem as well. And, and the, on the left hand side it's just a picture, of, one of many pictures of the community musicals and within that you had this sort of the the best of Scottish theatre and TV in the 70s and 80s came to Creative Miller to perform, you know, well connected with the 784 company and various other companies. So you had people like Bill Patterson and uh, 
John Murta and Billy Connolly came, Sean Connery came, Rich DeMarco came, and a whole series of people came, but the community musicals were, you could never, certainly the ones in the 70s, they were always sold out. They were, you couldn't, you, you very rarely could you get a ticket because it was just, uh, they were so popular. But again, it was using the arts and, and trying to reach that a high standard as well. But it was also linked to this um, very complex um, way of working where you're engaging with all aspects of society. Yeah, and again, a key part of the Craig Miller idea was that you brought together the professionals with the, the local residents. And yeah, that's right, yeah. There wasn't, there wasn't a gap between them. There wasn't a, an antagonism. It wasn't professionals doing things to them. That's it right. was um, a two-way, two-way collaboration. And um, again, it's it's a really interesting model, I think, of how you you use art, creativity, um, and professional skills uh, in a way that is actually accountable to local people through local institutions. Also, I think you, you know, said there's a lot of people who are involved and the local politicians were important as well, weren't they? Yeah. Uh, the local member of parliament, Dr. Gavin Strang, mm -hmm. and a number of the local councillors, you mentioned Paul Nolan and Davy Brown, Winnie Black. There are a number of people who, who meant that the, the political connections were, 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 were quite um, functional as well. Yeah, that's right. So, so if we can go to the next one. So, one of the aspects of it, of it is the was the street theatre, and what how it's influenced Edinburgh is um, is really that the street theatre that you see at the Edinburgh Festival really started with a, a guy called Neil Cameron, another one of these pioneers, who performed about 1971, 1972, but up the mound, he was the he was he he started juggling and then the theatre workshop when Reg Bolton was the director they began performing all over Edinburgh and there's a really nice photograph in the left top hand corner there where there's a, a woman dressed up in street theatre and there's a man there with a hat looking really confused but <laughs> why are they standing at the bus stop you know but that was the whole point was to challenge them with this sort of sort of creative way of doing things. And then you've got this fantastic photograph of uh, five uh, five boys um, on stilts and the wee kid in the front and Craig Muller. And that was sort of classic photograph of, of Craig Muller at that time. And th there is a lot of these photographs about, and hopefully we're going to be able to do something with, these, with this archive quite soon. Yeah, a key thing in that, you know, it just strikes me looking at that was to engage with the youth. I yeah. mean, there were a lot of kids, a lot of teenagers in Craig Miller in those days. And, uh, you know, facing quite a difficult uh, job market from the, the mid to late 70s on. And um, as well as the those activities, there was also the Adventure Playground that was created. Yeah. Which yeah. Princess Anne came along and opened. Mm -hmm. And um, so th there were just so many things going on, but I think they're lovely photos. Thanks, I, I've not got those. I think they're wonderful. Yeah, you can see them at Reg Bolton. If you've got Facebook and get Reg Bolton, you, be, there's, there's actually hundreds of these photographs all, all over Edinburgh. So they influenced a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, there, there are things in Edinburgh that you, you don't realise come from the community arts movement uh, from Craig Muller, but it wasn't just Craig Muller. I mean, you know, all across Scotland, there was all, all different types of community art groups, uh, Pilton, Wester Hills, uh, Easter House, there was a development in Dundee, there was some stuff in, in, in Aberdeen, and there was a huge amount down in, in England as well. So it was all part of this huge, massive uh, movement that came, and like the community murals, which I became, I became a muralist later on, you know, there was 2,000 community art murals in the States. It was a huge movement uh, that, that, that it was all part of a, a vast network that where all these things were developing. So if we go to the next one. So this is, um, uh, this is more information. That, uh, do you want to say anything about this? 
Yeah, it, well, it's, it's really just saying that, uh, can you just go back the one, please? DJ, can you just take it? Thanks, yeah. Yeah, it's just saying, you know, this was, as well as doing all that, they produced a regular newspaper, um, which uh, I think had about 10 pages in it. And this is from 1974, the one on the right there, celebrating the 10th uh, festival. And as, as uh, Andrew said, the, the festival held in mid-June was two weeks, it, it became at one stage a two week long festival. Uh, I think that was partly so that people could actually get in, as you say, for the, uh, for the, the, the highlight, which was always the musical. And I think often the musicals had a historical theme, I think, <laughs> um, that, that also often linked with, with the present. It's difficult to describe them all now, but um, that, that was a very standard type of thing. It was almost a time, I think one was actually a time travel uh, theme one, if I remember rightly. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and, and I, I think also, am I not mm -hmm. right in thinking, Andrew, that your mother actually had an input into scripting some of these things or contributing to, again, it was a community effort, it was a, set num a number of people, but I think some of the, because she had a very strong sort of sense of history, didn't she? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, she, she helped with the writing of it, so she, she, that was her one, that was her creative input into the festival itself was uh, her helping to get the script together because she had this sense of history in place so that was her her part of it and there was other people who particularly uh, Alice Henderson and say Johnny Stanton were, were, were more the stars of the theatre and also Faye Milligan is another one um, but there's so many people that I could mention you know that's the problem it, it, it's such a vast amount of people should be celebrated and you you very rarely hear of these stories and it, like that book that my mother published we we in the end had to publish it ourselves because we couldn't get a publisher you know like the like the, the two sculptures are, are no longer there you know and we'll go into another few minutes in a minute but so what was it what else were you saying cliff yeah i, th I think the, the, the other thing i'd just add on that was that part of this history bit is about identity uh, and it's about being proud that um, there's a history and that you know your place in it. And I think that again is a, a very powerful idea in terms of community-based activities. So let's just flick on to the next one quickly because uh, I'm taking up too much time here. Uh, so, so that's really just showing you know, a few press cuttings that, uh, as I said, the, the European project and um, the art center, the top left one there, is when the uh, art center was created there. So maybe you want to say a little bit about that. Well, I can remember the art center being started, and um, it was a, it was, a, it became a, a, a real set center point for a lot of things. A lot of great photography came out of there with Angie Catlin and uh, John Brown and various other people, and then later Mike Greenlaw took on the art center, and there was a lot of things that over many years were produced there. It was. Um, had a huge impact and it was there before Fort Kinnaird so now it's surrounded by this massive shopping mall but at that time it was um, it was quite isolated but we'll, we'll come on to that later on as well we'll return yeah, to this. Just say so it was in an old church as well we should mention. Yeah that's right yeah. yeah. And, and and finally yeah yeah I mean we talked about the caring sharing giant but um, then and I also mentioned the the cuts that came in so that's that's just showing that uh, although this fantastic story is there um it was not it was not all easy going it wasn't all rowing with the tide uh, and uh, there were quite a few um struggles a lot of arguments had to be made um you know it's, it's very often everybody looks back on things and say oh how wonderful but not everybody was saying that at the time and um and the fact that so much history has been erased really does show how this is a hidden history that certainly needs to be uh, rediscovered and lessons learned. Yeah, I mean, I think the festival has, has definitely got a, a, a legacy. Um, you know, it's not all plain, plain sailing that, are, that, you know, things go wrong. Um, it, it, but again, uh, Steve Burgess explained it very well. You know, it's, it's organic. So what happens is things flower and then, then, they, then, then they might die or whatever. But that's the nature of these sort of uh, community groups. You don't, in a way, you don't expect them to last forever. 
but they will change, the seed will go elsewhere, it will develop in all sorts of interesting ways, you know, but the, but the essence of the festival was, was this another Stratling, which was the gentle giant that cares and shares, and I think that's a really powerful, powerful message. So if you go on to the next one, so just bringing us up we, a wee bit more up to date and uh, things. So the, <clears throat> my mum, there was a plaque to, to my mother in the art centre, which has sadly disappeared, but, um, but we're, we're hopefully going to uh, do something about that and um, get a new artwork. But it was part of the women's uh, trail round Edinburgh. So there's actually, there's meant to be a, a, a trail of women who influenced um, Craig, uh, Edinburgh and my mother was part of that, so that was a, a good thing for my mother. But also uh, the, the photograph at the on the, the, the right hand side at the bottom is my daughter about 10 years ago, about 14 years ago, looking at the sculpture in the Scottish Parliament where I gave my mother's reference uh, and she talks about, uh, she had to come up with a quote from somebody she admired and she admired Agnes Muffet, who was one of the women that worked down the mines in uh, New Craig Hall. So the, the, there are, uh, my mother is remembered in various places. So next one, please. So it's just to show you more about what, uh, if I just give you a little bit about myself. So I became an artist, I went to Dundee Art College and then I went to Glasgow, became an illustrator. And then I eventually became a muralist. And there's one mural there of, uh, I did round the Scott Monument. And then there's another one there of, I did round the, when they were building the Museum of Scotland at Chamber Street. But also I went on to do murals and eventually did, uh, began working in Preston Pans and the Battle of Preston Pans. Um, uh, and at below there uh, was the Declaration of our Broth, but also worked in uh, Preston Pans and I worked at the Goth. Uh, I did a few of the murals, the random murals program for a while. Um, and then you see the witches mural behind the goth and I was also chairman of the Three Harbours Arts Festival and what I brought to these projects was was really this tradition of um, community arts because I am a child of of Craig Miller Community Arts and all I'm really doing all the time is, is I'm not reinventing anything I'm just carrying on that tradition and using that formula, that way of working, which, which my mother and all these wonderful people pioneered. So the next one, please. So uh, what's coming up soon, the Great Tapestry of Scotland, which is what a lot of people know me for, um, is getting a £7 million building at Gala Shields. And this is a, a, about a week ago getting built. This should be launched in the middle of next year. Um, and the Great Tapestry, which involved a thousand people, tells the story of Scotland. Um, when it was launched at the Parliament, I had thousands upon thousands of people came to visit it. But again, for me, I mean, other people will have another version of this, but for me, it is, it, this is a Craig Miller type community arts way of working. It, all, all I'm doing, because when I got the commission for this, I thought, well, if my mother can do the Festival Society, I'm probably pretty well place to do this because it's all about involving people, it's all about respect for the stitchers, it's all about getting as many people involved behind it as, as, in, as, as possible. So the next one please. So and there's other projects I'm doing just now which is um, again the same philosophy but you know they've got the cancer tapestry, you had, I did the thing called the Mount Felix tapestry which is in uh, which actually toured New Zealand last year that was at the National War Museum. Um, down in the left hand corner at the bottom is a panel designed by Jeff Palmer who did his talk on Monday and this was about the, the slave trade in Jamaica and about all the names of all the plantations that had all these Scottish names. So uh, uh, working with Jeff which I really enjoyed doing and I think these are really important stories to tell. And also you've got the Renfrewshire tapestry there as well which is an ongoing one but there's other ones, there's ones in Dundee One's in Aberdeen, Clark Manishire, there's the Midwife's panel, there's the Gordon Highlander's panel. There's, there's loads and loads of these projects because, again, but it all goes back, for me, it goes back to Craig Miller. Uh, next one, please. I think it's the final one. 
So the final one here is that the art centre that we were talking about earlier on, uh, <clears throat> through a wonderful woman called Rachel Coughlin, she's been able to galvanise us all to, to uh, get the art centre uh, back up and running under a new charity called um, Craig Miller Now, and that will open in about October. As you see, it's a fantastic space, and the idea is that the archives will go just beside, just below the, um, the stained glass uh, at, at, at the other end of what would have been the church. So, uh, and there's my mother uh, uh, 15 years ago looking at her archive. There are actually two archives. There's the Craig Muller uh, Archive Trust, I think it was called. That's got a huge collection and you've got my mother's own archive and also um, Steve Burgess's archive and they're both in the Edinburgh Library at the moment. Above that is the Craig Muller's Tapestry, which I'm involved with because one of the things that my mother wanted was she didn't really want a statue of her. She would have hated that idea. <laughs> but what she wanted, and this is, she started this, was to do a tapestry for Craig Miller, which is going to tr attempt to try to mention as many people as possible who are part of the festival and beyond. And so we're up to about 12 panels at the moment. Uh, it's been a slow process, but we are getting there. So. That is my slides. I've done it very quickly, and I'm exhausted. <laughs> well, well, well. Thanks. I mean, it's uh, there's there's a lifetime packed in there. Just one thing to ask you, Andrew. I mean, what was it like living at home with all this going on? Because I mean, I've got this little guide to Craig Miller, 1974-75. Um, this went to every household. I think it lists all the things that are happening all the contacts then. But I don't know if you can focus it, but yeah, it, I can see it, yeah. I'm not wrong. That's the address where it's all happening from is, is with your house. Yeah, six six nine seven three four four. Yeah, so so this is like um th th this is like 10, 12 years from the origins of Craig Miller Festival Society. It's on the cusp of getting, you know, what was it, quarter of a million pounds, which are a lot of money in those days from Europe. And it's all being run out of your front room, basically. Yeah, <laughs> it the, the, totally chaotic. Yeah, there was a printer, a Ronio printer in my parents' um, bedroom. And uh, the, yes, it was a constant stream of people coming and going. And my mother was very much, it was a passion. She, she loved doing it. And um, she, she wanted to, it wasn't about her. It wasn't about her being a great woman or anything. It was about her wanting to do something good for the, the people of Craig Mills. She wanted to do something positive that made a difference. And and she just uh, came across this idea, but it, she didn't come across it. it was, it's always about, um, it's not about individuals, it's about the collective, it's about uh, democracy, it's about uh, caring and sharing for everybody. It's quite a difficult thing to understand, but she, yeah, but I've been brought up with it. I didn't really realise how rich it was until probably in my 30s I began to realise, oh gosh, I, I had quite a, an unusual upbringing. And, um, so so uh, see, everybody just has streams of people coming in and out of the house at all times. I, mean, I, I remember that was one of the places, after a meeting, we'd either finish up at, at your house or at the uh, New Creek Hall Miners Welfare Club. Um, where I managed to get in there without wearing a tie because David Brown as the as the chair or president or whatever it was could, could talk me through but otherwise I think on a Friday night you were supposed to wear a tie which uh, I didn't very much in those days on now but yeah it, it's a remarkable story but I think you, you make really important points that um, you know I, I mean obviously you know Helen much better than I did but um, I absolutely agree with you the way that she would have seen it, that, um, that it was absolutely a collective effort. But also, I think we shouldn't understand the catalytic role that she played. I think that was very, very important. When she died, um, they, they wanted to do the sculpture. And I said at the meeting, my mother would have hated this. She really would, she'd much prefer Gulliver to come back. And somebody replied in true Craig Miles style, said, she's dead. She hasn't got anything to say, so she, you're getting the sculpture. So that's you know, and everybody laughed. 
So, you know, it's, uh, but it's, yeah, she, but yeah, she was a strong yeah. woman. She was a strong woman, like all, a lot of the women in Craig Miller. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, and you, know, you mentioned Alice Henderson, who is a fabulous singer and again, very strong person. But, but there's so many people so many. to mention. There's so many people to mention. So many. But I think one thing that's come out of tonight and has been running through all week is this, you know, on the one hand, intensely local activity that, you know, literally involved going around every household in Craig Miller and pushing leaflets through or talking with people, but it's also internationally connected. And I think that's been a theme right through that, um, whether it's, you know, walking in the, the, the footsteps of, of slave owners or, you know, the, the, the range of things the, the, that we've seen this week, a very common theme is that what you think is local is actually global. Anyway, we, we're running short of time, so I'm going to hand back to Terry and he'll pick up any questions we've got coming in and then we'll wrap up. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Cliff, for, for that. And what, a, what an incredibly stimulating kind of run through a part of the city that perhaps many of us don't know well enough. Um, so there's been a few questions that have come and a few few kind of earlier ones. And I think that th th there's a, a theme running through um, kind of many of them kind of already, which I'll just kind of ask, and that is, should the Craig Miller Festival Society be, be re reinvigorated or revived and perhaps form uh, a model that could be repeated in other parts of the city as in Wester Hales or Site Hill or in kind of Granton? Um, is, it, is it a model that could provide for a future vision for these these communities, um, I, I think it all uh, things develop naturally. They, they they organically grow. Things die. The seed goes elsewhere, and a lot of the seeds of Creek Miller actually don't now uh, live in Creek Miller. You know, they're they're, they're elsewhere. The, the message went round the world. There are other communities who do similar things. Uh, community arts idea never really died it, it just it carried on but then the festival itself wasn't it wasn't the beginning of that type of story that, that there are loads of examples of similar type organizations so I, I don't necessarily agree that you just take the model straight it would have to be in a more organic process which, which it reflects the area the what they want to do but I do think it's an inspiring story and I think it's if you can learn how, to, I think the most important thing is to learn how to do it properly. And if, and if you get it right, then you can get thousands of people uh, all working together. And that's a great model, but it doesn't work every time. And I don't think there isn't anybody out there who really understands it. I think I have a, a bit of an understanding, but it, is, but it is a difficult thing to understand. But if you get up and running, it's amazing what can happen. Yeah, and and as an extension, kind of of that idea, um, Craig Miller has undergone a, a significant transformation in kind of kind of recent years. Has almost been reconstructed. Um, and do you think, as part of any regeneration strategy, that a kind of arts-based um, community arts-based elements would actually be a useful tool to kind of bolt in into the, the to the regeneration process? Well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's very useful. It's the way, it's the way, instead of protesting, if you do it creatively, you can sometimes get much further, I think. And also, if you work together, I think there's, there's lots of things to be, to be learned in there. But it's, um, I don't know, it's, 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 it's I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'm going to have to leave that one just now, so. <laughs> just one okay. Minute. You know, I mean, so much housing is just produced as a house. I mean, it's going back to what we were saying earlier. Part of the genius in Craig Miller was to say that it's not just a housing issue. You know, you, you, don't, you don't do things in boxes. And yet what we're now doing is just doing houses. Okay, to some extent there's concern about the environment, but, you know, wouldn't it be different if every major housing development included a grant to towards the formation of some sort of community arts activity in that area. Yeah. I suspect that for a relatively <clears throat> short amount of money, you could get 
a big return, at least in some areas. It wouldn't always work, as, as Andrew is saying, it is organic, key individuals and so on. But it's, uh, it's, it worked in Craig Miller. A little bit of money helped enormously. It didn't be, depend on money at the start, but then when money began to come in, that helped everything flourish. I think the other thing you got, but why I stumbled there, because I forgot what I was going to say, which was that, you know, before the festival and the community arts movement, you didn't have uh, uh, people working in community settings like this. And you've got a lot of that now. You know, you get a lot of projects where the money's put to, you, you have community art workers. They might not call themselves community art workers, but they're working in community settings. Also like art in prison, art in um, hospitals, I'm not saying the whole the whole thing comes out of Craig Miller. It comes out of, of a certain era, but but a lot of but a lot of that way of working of using art in a in a context uh, uh, can be very articulate at times and can actually change things. Uh, it can also be to tokenistic as well. But what the community arts movement did or that period did was they introduced a lot of things that we now take for granted. Uh, uh, you'd expect them to be there. I think they can go a lot further with that. I think you can still develop it. I mean, there isn't really an education programme that studies these things or trains up uh, young artists to how to do that, because there is a knowledge of how to do it. But uh, it's another way that the community arts movement has actually changed things, changed society. But again, it's one of these uh, unspoken stories that uh, hasn't really uh, been told. Fantastic. <clears throat> and of course, one of our attendees uh, kind of reminds us that there still continues to be many excellent kind of initiatives yes. and individuals doing things, which is perhaps one of the legacies that that, that has continued from that. Um, we have a question kind of here that somebody's asked is what, in, in your opinion, in reflecting upon that entire um, involvement that you've actually had in the Craig Miller Festival story, would be the most important element of the episode of that story, which should be celebrated once more in either music, art or theatre? What would be the one thing that you would pick up and run with now? Well, I'd pick up from the, the time in Craig Ma, what, what I remember. Or if the, you wanted something to re-celebrate, what would it be? Oh, I, I, I think just singing the songs again, the, the songs that, that, that come from the festival, uh, I think a film of the festival would be great to tell that story because it is a remarkable story of its time. Uh, again, it isn't the only story. There are, as the person who's asked the question, there are lots of good examples of similar type of work that have taken it further forward. And there will be in the future things like that. But the, for me, I think the essence of the festival is probably Janet Howey singing when people, uh, history will be made when people play their part or Craig Miller Now song or these sort of classic uh, community art songs uh, that Douglas Galbraith and many other people uh, wrote would be, for me, I think if I was asking my mother, she'd just want them to sing the songs again. Fantastic, fantastic. And of course, one, one attendee has reminded us of the, the former policy of 1% for arts, um, which maybe is something that could, could be something to be advocated, in fact, out of all of this for all of the hidden stories that, that come from it. Um, kind of another question which came in before we began, which is quite interesting and um, in a sense from how you've discussed it is, but, but how engaged was was the greater Edinburgh, or the wider Edinburgh population with the Craig Miller Festival Society and the Craig Miller Festival overall. Um, was it seen as something which was, was integral to um, what we would describe today as the festival city um, or was it something that was peripheral to, you know, the International Festival and Fridge? I think to certain people like Richard DeMarco and things, they, they would say this is the real Edinburgh Festival, not the not the, the International Festival. My mother loved the, the festival, I have to say, the Edinburgh Festival. I, I, I think it's ambivalent. I don't think it was seen, because Craig Miller was stigmatised and, and still to a point is still stigmatised, though it has changed a lot uh, because of the, 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 the regeneration. And so it, it, it was sort of, it sort of, it was grudgingly given that there was something was happening at Craig Miller, I think would be the thing. 
but then you had this sort of international flow of people coming in who wanted to know how it was. So it was an uphill struggle. Uh, I mean, there's lots of issues within that, but 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 at the same time, my mother was always in the face, always in the evening news, always in the Scotsman, um, uh, that type of thing. So that there, there was. It's sort of mixed, I would have said. It wasn't it's sort of, you know, Craig Miller still had that negative uh, uh, stigma attached to it. So it was, I would say, grudgingly. And you still don't have a major exhibition about how how something like, well, how uh, this type, this way of working actually influenced everything or, or celebrating these pioneers or, or whatever. So we've still got a way to go for it to be accepted, but it's 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 certainly I would say it's beginning to change, but it's um, a lot of time people would say um, you know Kumi Arts is dead, it doesn't exist anymore. People are not interested in that, and I just don't believe that. You know, so it's yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I don't think I'm fully under uh, answered it, but I, I think it's watch the space. Fantastic. Okay, great. And and of course, we've had one person in the chat function say to remind us that the story is being told and that somebody is studying arts and health and, and the community arts story, including Craig Miller, um, is an integral part of that story in the development of the field of arts and health. So that's yeah. a, a legacy which is clearly coming out from, from this fantastic story. Yeah, I mean, it has got a legacy, that's what I'm saying. Uh, but it's, it's, it's still got to be unpicked and 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 recognise and actually show the facts of, of how it influenced things, you know, and, and, and its relationship with itself, with Edinburgh and the, the wider world and, and all of the fantastic projects that are out there. Because it is all about working together and being positive and celebrating as many people as possible. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. And, and kind of time is catching up on us here and um, there is kind of, kind of one question which is perhaps uh, and I know that you've been kind of following all of the Coburn conversations with it but but as an artist um, when we're confronted with with some of the contested or the hidden histories that 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 lie behind some of the public arts with the public monuments that we see in front of us um, as a as a community-based artists, what kind of strategies would you recommend for the City of Edinburgh Council or indeed all local authorities uh, or people who are interested um, to deal with the tensions at high and behind these these contested objects? Well, I think it's like with the work I've done with the Great Tapestry of Scotland and the Scottish Diaspora Tapestry, particularly, I'm working with Jeff Palmer, is that, you know, I, I, I've been, I've had to learn these uncomfortable stories as well, you know, and it's, so it's like you, you, you have to learn about these and then you begin to realise there's a much wider story to be told and it has to, you have to get it out there. But I think in an artistic way is to try and tell these, these stories, but do it in a way that uh, 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 highlights the, the way, but try and do them in an interesting way. Uh, a manner that's, um, uh, but it's an ongoing process. I mean, the tapestries that I'm involved in, they're all meant to be added to because it, once you start going into these sometimes uncomfortable stories, uh, they all should be there as well. You know what I mean? But it is an ongoing process because a lot of history uh, is, hasn't been told yet, you know, and, and, and it has, a lot of these stories have to come out and they have to be told. And I think by doing that, we'll begin to educate myself and lots of other people of, of a much wider and a much richer history. <clears throat> That's brilliant. And of course, last night, as you remember, is Lisa Williams, um, you know, suggested that the creative arts can be one of the, 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 the major vehicles for helping tell these stories and helping Drew to, to um, reinterpret them. Um, that's the kind of end of the questions. And I see that we're just bumping up to the end of our kind of time, which has been, yeah, it's gone so quickly. All of these, these conversations have gone so quickly. Um, but what I'll do now is hand over to Professor Haig um, to kind of wind things up. Cliff. Uh, thanks, Terry. And uh, yeah, thanks to everybody who's uh, followed tonight's discussion. Um, we, I think, have opened up a number of uh, ideas that we discovered from the past. But the special thanks, obviously, to Andrew for sharing his uh, 
his insights with us and some of his own work. And it seems to me as well, one of the things that came out of Craig Miller, as well as the community arts, was a sort of vision of a model of governance that was about an interrelationship between the council, uh, which legitimately had responsibilities in respect to a number of key services, but also the community and the users of those services. And this model that was talked about, I think is still something that we could learn about is how to form a much more uh, inclusive relationship between the administration and the communities and the roles that communities can take on. And um, nobody should underestimate the significance of, of what was done in Craig Miller. It was absolutely amazing story. And uh, if we can do it once, I think we could do it again. So um, thanks to everybody, a special thanks to Andrew and um, to the team at the Coburn who put together this event and the others. And we've got one left tomorrow night, uh, which Terry will probably just remind you of with a usual appeal for contributions <laughs> as well. Back to Terry. Uh, thank you very much. I have to fulfil my, my, my function there. Thank you. Uh, and of course, we have one more Coburn Conversations, uh, which is uh, at the same time tomorrow night with, with uh, Sarah Sheridan asking the question of where are the women? Um, and she has a fantastic kind of book out in bookshops now, to, which is a great kind of, kind of reference volume. Um, and that kind of concludes kind of tonight's Coburn Conversation. I would remind you again over this weekend, um, Doors Open Days is taking place, virtually of course, uh, and all the information of some 72 venues I think that are participating <clears throat> is now available on our kind of website. Some of the stuff hasn't been made live yet, but you'll need to kind of wait for the day so to speak. But go have a look at our website, cobernassociation.org.uk backslash Doors Open Days to see just the kind of wealth of things that you can kind of participate on uh, going forward. And of course do uh, we, we would encourage you to consider becoming a member of the Coburn or making a small donation because it helps us bring uh, these conversations kind of to you as well as activities like Doors Open Days. <clears throat> so it just uh, falls to me to, to kind of end by thanking our two conversationalists tonight, Professor Cliff A, Chairman of the Coburn, and Andrew Crummy for telling us the most fantastic story of helping the people to sing. Thank you very much.